Okay, so um, I'm going to be presenting on our senior project, which is a high altitude balloon. Um, none of my other group members are here because they're all on vacation, but we are a group of five people. Um, Francis, Monthan, Connor, and John are all electricals, and I'm the computer, and then our advisors at TCNJ are Dr. Woody and Dr. Khan. Um, so a little bit about us, I guess, even though they aren't here. Um, as I said before, the rest of them are all electrical. I'm computer. Um, a lot of them have interests in um, hardware design and quality control. And I believe, I think like three or four of us have jobs lined up. And I know um, like Monthan and Connor and possibly also Frankie are considering um, graduate school. Um, we're also all seniors. Personally, I'm gonna be working in project management and consulting. Um, so that's what our future paths look like. Um, so what is a weather balloon and like, why do you care? Um, weather balloons are the primary source of data for anything that's like not on surface level. So they provide um, a lot of the important information that you need for weather forecasting and for meteorologists to essentially um, do their research and gather data. Um, and then using the data that they get from the balloon launches, um, they can create models and algorithms that can use the data gathered to simulate future weather. Um, and a lot of people use this, including like the National Weather Service and even like your local TV weatherman. Um, I know like the National Weather Service um, launches about like 50,000 balloons um, on the same day at like places all over um, the United States. And they use um, all of the launches and like correlate all the data to get um, relevant statistics and information. Um, and then just a general, uh, what it looks like. Um, on the right, you can see we have a balloon. It's going to be filled with helium. It's not ours, but this is what it would look like. Um, and then we get this would be a parachute. And then there's some sort of rigging, which is going to come in the form of a 40 pound, 50 pound kite string. And then the payload, which is where most of our work this semester and last semester has gone into. Um, so, what are we actually trying to do? Um, we're going to launch based on our problem statement, we're launching a 600 gram weather balloon. 600 grams is not the size, but rather the weight of the actual latex balloon that we're gonna be using. And then um, the balloon is gonna have a payload which will collect atmospheric data like temperature, humidity, pressure, air quality. And then uh, we also want to track the GPS location um, so we can draw meaningful conclusions because the weather in New Jersey is obviously very different than the weather in California. Um, so location is also important. And then we're gonna store that data onto a micro SD card. And then once we have collected the data, uh, we'll create like some sort of RStudio um, analyzing module. So you can create um, plots like the one on the right. Um, this is one of like the many plots that we're probably gonna create. Um, the one on the right is temperature versus altitude. So as you can see, as you go up in altitude, you generally go up in also, or go um, down in temperature, but um, it also depends because um, certain like layers of the Earth's atmosphere have certain effects on temperature. So you can kind of see a sample breakdown on the right, but with the data we collect, we probably do a similar breakdown and make sure that our readings at least are accurate. And this would be one way of kind of verifying that our readings are following the trend of the data we've collected. Um, so for a system overview, um, we have a lot of moving pieces, but we also have five people. So we have the balloon system, which consists of the actual balloon, the parachute, and how we connect it together with the string. And then um, the main like part of our senior project is, and most of our last semester work and some of our this semester work has been the payload design, which basically encompasses all of the other systems. So that has the power unit, which is making sure um, the batteries uh, can power all the other systems. And then the sensor system, which actually collects the readings that we want, so temperature, pressure, humidity. It also has gyroscope, so things like that. And then um, communication, which is being able to track the balloon from the ground and storing that data somewhere also. And then um, recently, just this semester, we added a camera because we got extra funding. So even if something were to happen um, with the device um, when it's eventually, when the payload is eventually recovered, 
uh, we'd be able to see sort of like the curve of um, the Earth's atmosphere and get some really nice visuals. And then having all of that be stored on an SD card, which is their data storage. And then once all of that is done and the payload has been recovered, um, analyzing the data. And as of right now, um, we uh, don't have sensor data being received from us on the ground. So the way the communication module set up or is, is set up right now is that it only transmits GPS data to us on the ground, but we're hoping that within like the next few weeks, we can also um, make sure we have enough bandwidth to also transfer sensor data. So on the off chance that for whatever reason, we aren't able to recover our balloon or our payload, um, we wouldn't essentially lose on the data because um, without the data, we can't analyze anything. We can't create any other real product. So um, we're hoping to also add that to the functionality. Um, so for the power system, um, we were looking into batteries that operate at really, really low temperatures because at 60,000 feet, um, which is roughly 30,000 meters, which is basically 30 kilometers, um, it gets really, really cold. And so you did it, you want batteries that you know aren't going to have like decreased capacity significantly in cold weather. So we looked into, or I guess John actually looked into different batteries and he found the Energizer Ultimate Lithium. Um, it is made and can accommodate to really, really low temperatures. Um, we're trying to, we're assuming the operating range is gonna be between um, like normal room temperature to um, almost negative 40 degrees. Celsius. So we want batteries that can operate in that range. And Energizer says that their L91s can do that. So those are the ones we're going with. And they're also relatively affordable. And then we're going to put them in bricks of batteries, which you'll see later, um, which will then have individual power units to the communication and sensor systems. And they're going to be individually in separate bricks, just in case something were to happen with one of the batteries or something were to go wrong, then um, they have like independent power sources. So if the sensor stopped collecting data, at least we'd be, able, we'd be able to track. And if the GPS stopped being stopped having enough power to transmit, then for whatever reason, at least the sensor would still be able to collect the data. And then hopefully we'd recover it because someone would call and they found our package. Um, but that's why we're using those batteries and they're going to be in two separate bricks. And then for the sensor system, which is I would say probably the most important part, if not equally as important as the GPS system, we're using the Arduino Nikola Sense ME, um, and it measures temperature, humidity, atmospheric pressure, and air quality, um, and it has like gyroscope measurements available. Also, um, the Nikola Sense ME actually came out in, I think, November, and we put in the pre-order for it in October because um, if you can see, it's like number one on the right-hand side. So it has an incredibly, incredibly small form factor and it's made and geared towards these type of projects. I believe like on their specification site or on their pre-launch site, they even said um, like made for weather, like can be used in weather balloons. Um, so it has an incredibly small form factor. It's basically like handmade for this type of application. So it can operate at really low temperatures. It also has power save mode, generates very little internal heat to affect the readings that's gonna end up capturing. And it also weighs very, very little. Our second most important concern was um, weight because we are gonna be launching this balloon. And if you go past a certain weight threshold, then you have to apply for a special FAA permit. So we wanted to avoid that because it is possible to avoid needing a permit. Um, so to do that, you have to stay underneath um, Four pounds, but based on the based on the restrictions of our balloon type being 600 grams, um, that can support a payload of max two pounds. So we went from four pounds to two pounds. So we have to have everything fall underneath that weight, and therefore um, we want all of our Arduinos and everything to weigh as little as possible. Um, the most the heaviest thing is the batteries, and then the camera. But considering that everything else weighs very, very little, we should be underneath two pounds. And as of right now, we are. Um, but the way the sensor system works is 
you have the Nicola Sense ME, which has been programmed to um, get all the readings that we need. So temperature, humidity, atmospheric pressure, and air quality. And then um, it's been calibrated to have accurate readings. When we first received the Nicola Sense ME, the readings were not calibrated. Our, our humidity was showing up to be like 50% inside TC and J room, um, which is not accurate. Um, so we had to kind of troubleshoot um, how to calibrate it. Cause at the time it was also like a month after um, they were first sold. So there wasn't a lot of documentation and people were still talking in the forums of like, how do I actually calibrate it and get accurate readings? But now it's been calibrated. And then the data um, from that would appear in the console of Arduino is being written out to the micro SD shield in the form of like a comma separated value. So that way it's really easy post launch and recovery to take the data and put it into Excel and then like manipulate it to do whatever we needed to do. And then for the sensor system, we require three of the batteries. So they're in a block in number three. Um, and then this is the micro SD shield. So we can actually write to the SD card. And then the second most important part is the communication system. Um, so the communication system uses um, five different things to essentially transmit the data from the payload to the ground. So um, we use an RFD 900 plus modem and that should be able to transmit over 60,000 feet um, at 90 megahertz. Um, we've done testing, I don't have a photo of it, um, but we've done testing of having um, and one of my other group members drive around TCNJ and you can see it logs um, the route and I think it transmits like every five seconds um, and you can essentially follow their driving. We're gonna be testing um, further distances. So maybe like one of us, if we're going somewhere for the weekend, um, we can let another group member know and try doing maybe like 40 miles or like 20 miles um, just so we know that it can transmit at a much larger distance. And then we also have an Arduino Nano, which takes the data that comes from the modem and stores it in a readable format. So um, the data that comes from the modem is raw, and then we make it into a readable format by removing like unnecessary information, unnecessary characters. And then um, we store it on the SD card on the Nano. And then um, just in case um, we can't find it, then at least later on, um, we have the actual GPS data stored somewhere. And then we also have a receiver. So ideally we'd want the antenna to broadcast the GPS data and then the receiver will receive it. So that way um, when we're on the ground in our cars, um, we can actively track the balloon as it's traveling. Um, so this module can receive a location within the satellite within like 10 feet of the device. So ideally the readings are very accurate. And then, um, we also have, um, as I mentioned before, the micro SD card, and then we have the battery pack. Um, there's one on the payload and there's one on the base station. So if you look on the right, um, this is actually the module that's gonna go on the payload. Um, it's very small, it takes a very little space. Um, again, the heaviest thing is the um, battery. And then on the base station, which is on the ground with us, we have the photo on the left. Um, we will not be using these um, smaller antennas. These will go actually on the payload. And then we have a very big um, Yagi antenna that covers a much larger distance. I don't have a photo of it. and I don't really know the specifics. Sorry, this isn't my area, but um, basically the Yagi antenna will be on the ground with us and has a much wider range versus because of um, weight and size restrictions on the payload, we have a much smaller antenna, which covers a smaller range. So um, we're hoping that the larger antenna will essentially make up for the space that we're losing with the one on the payload. Um, but yeah, that is our communication system. And then if we were to lose, um, essentially lose transmission of data in between, um, we have a trajectory, which I'll also show later, um, that should still help us stay within um, like a reasonable range. So we still be able to recover the package. Um, so this is what our actual balloon and rigging will look like. Um, we're gonna have a payload and all of the systems I mentioned before will be put in a payload. 
which is essentially a styrofoam box, which is going to weigh between one to two pounds. And we'll have a communication system, the power system, and the sensor system. And then we're going to rig it to a parachute. Um, the parachute is going to be in between the balloon and the payload. This is because the way weather balloons work is you fill the balloon up with helium, it rises, and the way it comes back down is naturally the balloon will just burst at a high enough altitude. So once the balloon bursts, the entire, the entire thing comes down. So we want to put the parachute in between the payload and the balloon. So that way, when the balloon does burst, um, the 600 grams that the balloon weighs um, doesn't crush and damage the payload. And we also want to obviously slow down its rate of descent. So we do that by using a parachute. Um, and we have a three feet parachute considering our payload is going to be relatively very small. And our balloon is also, I would say like a mid-sized balloon. Um, so the parachute will not only slow down um, the descent rate of the payload, but also kind of provide some extra protection um, from the weight of the balloon because the balloon is gonna be considerably larger than the package. Um, and we don't want the balloon to kind of like jostle things around and um, maybe create some disconnects within the payload. Um, and the payload is gonna be a styrofoam box um, because our other concern is uh, thermal insulation because it does get really, really cold. Um, all of our materials have been chosen to kind of withstand the cold temperatures. That being said, um, there is like very, very high wind drift that high up. And so it probably feels colder than it actually is. Um, and we want to just kind of take the extra precaution and instead of putting it in a plastic box, we'll put it in a styrofoam box um, to make sure that we don't lose power or functionality when we're in the air. And then they're gonna be connected by a 50 pound kite string, which is um, the highest weight kite string we can use without needing to get an FAA permit. And then in terms of actual launch and recovery, um, we had some issues sourcing the helium. Um, that being said, that has been fixed. We have the helium tank. Um, we are working on getting like the gauges and the equipment we need to actually fill up the balloon. Um, but that being said, we will be launching sometime between April 1st and April 22nd. Um, we're aiming to launch West Pennsylvania or um, by Dover specifically. Um, the one, the photo that you can see below is actually right next over so it kind of predicts that trajectory um, we want to go to west pennsylvania because the wood drift obviously pushes the balloon out east and we don't want to go we don't want it to go too far east and into the water because then we won't be able to recover our payload so we want to do west pennsylvania or you don't mind going as far as we need to go um, that being said the wind like in april and may is may is like less so but april the wind drift is very very high or very strong in um, those high altitudes. And so um, we'd rather overcorrect and go further out west than needed than have to worry about possibly landing in the water. Um, so we're using a predictor for uh, weather blue launches uh, made, I think, by like a company or a group of people in the United Kingdom. But um, the readings are still accurate in the United States within 10% of like direction and trajectory and launch location and um, recovery location. So we've basically inserted our, um, our constraints. And so we have um, 100 grams as our payload mass, which is about a little bit more than two pounds um, just to be safe because you never know. And then for balloon mass, um, we have a KMOS 600 balloon. So we just put in that balloon. And then our target burst altitude was um, 60,000 feet, which is roughly 30,000 meters, um, but it is the first time we're doing it. So we went for like, roughly a little bit lower. Um, and then from that, we received our um, time to burst. So it's gonna take an hour or two hours, essentially to reach to the top of its trajectory and burst. And then um, it also tells very helpfully it also gives us exactly how much um, helium we should need. So for this launch, we would need 73.4 cubic feet of helium. Um, and then on the right, it shows the actual trajectory. So it would take off. We would launch it in Dover, and then it would pop somewhere over like northern Philadelphia. Um, and then um, 
it would make its descent um, closer to T, C, and J. Um, and so this, the model can only predict 180 hours in the future. Um, so we essentially have to keep rerunning models. Um, so this model, um, I actually just regenerated for us this morning, um, is for March 23rd. And um, just to show how windy some days are compared to other days recently, um, I also ran it for March 22nd, uh, which is the day before. And I don't know if it's gonna show up. So if you run the same launch location, everything's exactly the same, but you put in March 22nd, it's a wildly different trajectory, pops in a totally different location, um, lands in the water, um, and that's exactly what we're trying to avoid. Um, but that's what we're rerunning and hoping to launch April 1st to 22nd. Um, and yeah, that's all I have. Does anyone have any questions? Well, we're actually a little bit tight on, uh, well, I shouldn't say we're tight in time. We have good time, actually. Uh, are there any questions? I'll ask you a few questions if no one has any questions. Did you consider for you, you're talking about the, the lines and using kite. I haven't looked into kite, kite but I, I know a little bit about fishing and there's some very heavy duty fishing line you can purchase uh, to connect things. You ever look at using fishing line? Um, we didn't look into fishing line, but we've already purchased the kite string. So we'll probably continue, but I do know that like the 50 pound kite string is like the standard for um, like launches without an FAA permit. So I just figured don't fix something that isn't broken. Um, okay. But like for future launches, I'm sure people could use fishing line. It's just a, uh, there's a lot of variety, different materials uh, and issues of stretch. It's very, you know, it's a, something to look at as an alternate. Uh, the other question I was going to ask you were talking about your communication system and, uh, you know, using the uh, antennas you have on the, uh, on the uh, balloon. There's a lot of things, since you know the balloon is always going to be pointing down, mm -hmm. there, there are more efficient antennas you can use than just a, uh, uh, a single whip, because the whip is going to basically try to send energy in all directions. So if you use, uh, it doesn't have to be a very complicated antenna, but one that is beaming toward the earth, you'll double your effective radiated power immediately over just using a whip type antenna, as I understood. And on, on top of that, I think you're using what is referred to uh, as a rubber ducky, uh, which is a, a short, a shorter antenna that, that it works pretty well, but it, it's less than 100% efficiency. Efficient. There's a compromise in using a rubber ducky type of structure, which is handy for handy talkies. But I'm not sure that's what you want to use uh, on the uh, on the balloon. Um, yeah, I can't say like for 100% certainty because um, Martin and Frankie kind of headed communications with Dr. Khan, but um, I think that. We were also, well, honestly, I don't really know, but um, I do know that they essentially went through the options with Dr. Khan and based on what she gave them, um, that was like the parts that they chose. The other thing that I was gonna mention is it doesn't sound like you've looked at a, uh, you can calculate and fairly accurate because this is a line of sight communications mm -hmm. path. You can fairly accurately uh, predict what your link's going to be exactly. You know, are you going to be above the signal to noise ratio you need or below the signal to noise ratio? That is a, you know, sometimes you can't do that if for some pass because you really don't have a true line of sight. But with a balloon, you have a true line of sight path. So something you might want to consider, I know it's getting late in the project, is but considering what your, your, your link is going to be mm -hmm. like and your link budget, it'll tell you what you need in terms of the gains of your antennas, how much power you have. Uh, I don't think you're going to have a problem but it, 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 with this, but it, it, sometimes you can be surprised unless you put the numbers in and do the calculations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we can definitely do the calculations and then see if we can make changes. 
And I want to thank you for an excellent pr presentation. Very clear. Uh, thank you.